recording and introduce our host for the evening. We are very happy to have PNC Arts Alive as our sponsor for the Cultural Conversations series and have I have a hard time working the computer. PNC Arts Alive and representing them tonight is Tracy Saranz Sorzano, Senior Vice President, Market Leader for Florida East in the PNC Wealth Management Department. And I welcome Tracy for your comments. Thank you, Nancy. It's a pleasure to be joining you this evening. We at PNC are excited once again to be a sponsor of the Arts Council of Martin County and Cultural Conversations. PNC has a long history of partnering with local organizations that strengthen and enhance our communities. We know what art can do, how it changes perspectives, and even how it changes lives. From classical music and fine art to dance and theater, we also understand that a rich arts community is a significant driver of South Florida's economic success. And we're committed to keeping the $4 billion arts and culture industry alive in Florida by funding quality programming through PNC Arts Alive, one of our signature grant making programs. PNC has pledged over $1 million to area organizations and supported 44 programs since launching this initiative in Southeast Florida in 2016. With the unanticipated impact of the pandemic on live performances and gatherings, the support we give to the arts in our community is more important than ever. PNC is delighted to partner with organizations like the Arts Council of Martin County as they bring their programming to the community in a virtual format and continue their mission of enriching the lives of residents and visitors alike by showcasing the creativity, talent, and passion of our local artists. Thank you again for letting PNC be a part of tonight's program, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guests for the evening, Dennis O'Donovan and ACT Studio Theater. ACT Studio Theater is a small theater in Stewart. While they await the opportunity to safely resume live performances at the studio, they're presenting a series of online entertainment viewable on their YouTube channel. You can subscribe to ACT on their webpage, actstudiotheater.com, Facebook, or YouTube channel to receive all their latest news. Dennis O'Donovan is ACT's president and artistic director. Dennis has been a theater lover since his preteen days, staging plays in his basement with and for family members. Leading an organization like ACT represents the realization of a lifelong dream. Dennis studied acting at New York City's HB Studio. When living on Long Island, he served as producer for the Suburban Players and was the founder of the Suburban Junior Players. Dennis has also toured for several seasons with Plaza Theatrical Productions. Please join me in welcoming Dennis to share with us all Shakespeare's Villains. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining and thank you, Nancy, uh, for inviting me and thank you, Tracy, for that wonderful introduction. Um, as they said, I have been a lifelong lover of theater and uh, Shakespeare for almost that entire time. And I started to realize my dream of beginning to direct the Shakespeare plays and uh, at Arts Fest in February, we're doing a Midsummer Night stream. Uh, outdoors, we hope you'll come see it. Okay, so oh, I need screen sharing, please. So this presentation is about uh, Shakespeare's villains, uh, what makes them so fun, and um, they're fun because it's Shakespeare. And because villains are, are fascinating, uh, they're very unapologetic about who they are. They, they rarely have self-doubt and they kind of charge forward to, uh, to realize their evil dreams. And Shakespeare wrote some real dandies. So um, what is a villain? Well, a villain is somebody who chooses evil, chooses to walk an evil path. They generally don't have concern for their impact on others. Uh, in fact, they are often quite deliberately cruel and, and destructive to others. And 
to be a successful villain in life and in Shakespeare, you need the means to implement their plans. So many of Shakespeare's villains are people with power. So which villains were we considering for this presentation? This is a, a partial list of the villains in Shakespeare. And I'll quickly run down. On the left, we have everybody who we rejected. So Claudius and Hamlet, um, a little bit less ambitious than we look for. Edmund and King Lear got caught up in, in a family power struggle. Regan in King Lear was largely a, uh, an ungrateful daughter who, who um, set in motion a devastating war in her country just out of lack of, lack of familial, uh, familial duty. Macbeth of the play that bears his name. He didn't make the list primarily because Macbeth is more of a tool than, than a villain. And we'll get to the contrast who is a villain in Macbeth in just a moment. Tybalt in Romeo and Juliet, the nephew of, Cap, of, uh, of Capulet, who, uh, who kills Mercutio, Romeo's good friend, but he's just caught up in a family conflict. He's just doing what is called, uh, called on for his family, and he's a hothead. So he's not a villain. Caliban, Tempest, uh, half human, half fish, half demon, whatever. He was a slave and he rebelled and he sought the death of his, form, of his master. Kind of excusable when you're a slave, you know, that doesn't make you evil if you seek uh, vengeance. Shylock, the merchant of Venice. A lot of people consider Shylock a tremendous villain. Well, Shylock was the recipient of anti-Semitic attitudes in, in Europe prevailing at the time for centuries. Um, and in fact, at the end of the play, not only has he not exacted the, the pound of flesh penalty on the gentleman who borrows his money, but he is financially ruined in court. Uh, so, so he is destroyed. So not a successful villain. Aaron the Moor and Tamora in Titus Andronicus, they are the losers in a devastating war and they seek vengeance against the victorious king. Uh, but that's also partly because that victorious king very cruelly um, sacrificed and, and, um, and destroyed the children of Tamora. So it's as much revenge as anything else. So none of that really rises to the level of villain. But now let's get to the villains that I selected. First of all, Cassius and Julius Caesar. Cassius is the father of the plot to kill Julius Caesar, to assassinate him. And while there were many in the Senate of, of Rome who felt that Caesar had overstepped his authority and was becoming a tyrant, Cassius was motivated by envy and, and, and seeking power. And the other thing is that he did it from behind the scenes. I'll get into that. Lady Macbeth, there is your villain in Macbeth. Lady Macbeth is the driver of everything evil that happens in the play. Don John, much ado about nothing. Don John is the bastard brother of Don Pedro, who is the hero of the play, uh, a, a general who comes riding into, into the plantation of Leonato and brings his, his merry men with him who bestow all kinds of wonderful things upon the people at the plantation. But Don John, just out of perverseness of nature, decides that's not good. That's not desirable. I'm going to interfere with that. Iago, Othello, one of the better known villains. Iago, just out of hatred for Othello, the Moorish general, uh, decides to ruin him because he's been passed over for promotion. And he destroys his family. He destroys people in, in the in the in the neighboring area, um, and he just embraces evil. And last but 
certainly not least Richard of Richard III, Richard Gloucester of the famous English War of the Roses. Richard was a hunchback. He, he was crippled. He had, he had a variety of ailments and was never well regarded by his family or anyone else in the, in the, in the king's court because he was seen as hideous and, and you know, assumed to be an idiot. In fact, he was one of the very smartest people in court. And he decided that, okay, enough of this, I'm going to be king. Anyone between me and the throne is going to die. And he very, very effectively and efficiently puts in plan uh, a plot to do just that. So those are our five villains for tonight. So how do we pick them? Well, for one thing, the purity of their evil. The fact that they declare, declare their evil intent, their willingness to be evil, their willingness to define themselves as evil. And finally, the impact of their actions. They have profoundly impacted others by their, by their actions. So let's move on to our first villain, Iago. He's motivated primarily by a grievance and by envy. He's been passed over for promotion by Othello and he dedicates himself to Othello's ruin. So I'm now gonna show you a couple of scenes of Iago in action. In personal suit to make me his lieutenant. Sorry, I'm not, I don't think I'm sharing that. Hold on just one moment. Here we go. Off cap to him and by the faith of man, I know my price. I'm worth no worth to place, but he, as loving his own pride and purposes, evades them with a bombast circumstance, horribly stuffed with epithets of war. None suits my mediators, for certes, says he, I already chose my officer. And what was he, forsooth, a great arithmetician? One Michael Cassio, a Florentine, a fellow almost damned in a fair wife, that never set squadron in the field, nor the division of battle knows, more than a spinster, unless the bookish Theoric, wherein the Togid consuls can propose, as masterly as he, mere prattle without practice, in all his soldiership, but he, sir, had the election, and I, whom his eyes had seen the proof at Rhodes, Cyprus, and on other grounds, Christian and heathen, must be be led and calmed by debtor and creditor, this countercaster. He in good time must his lieutenant be, and I, God bless the mark, his worship's ancient. So here, here we clearly have a disgruntled employee. Uh, he he believes he deserved the promotion, and he decides he will do what he can to hurt Othello. Now, he doesn't come out forward and declare himself, except to a few close friends, but instead he explains why he will choose to, why he will choose to, uh, I'm sorry, while he will choose to stay in the background and smile at Othello. Oh, sir, content you. I follow him to serve my turn upon him. We cannot all be masters, nor all masters cannot be truly followed. You shall mark many a duteous and knee-crooking knave that doting on his own obsequious bondage wears out his time, much like his master's ass. For naught but provender, and when he's old, cashiered. With me such honest knaves, other there are who trimmed and formed and visages of duty keep yet their hearts attending on themselves and throwing but shows of service on their lords do well thrive by them and when they have lined their coats do themselves homage these fellows have some soul and such a one do i profess myself for sir it is as sure as you were rodrigo were i the more i would not be iago in following him I follow but myself. Heaven is my judge. Not I for love and duty, but 
seeming so for my peculiar end. For when my outward action doth demonstrate the native act and figure of my heart in complement extern, tis not long after that I will wear my heart upon my sleeve for dogs to pick at. I am not what I am. Okay, he has declared himself. Now his plot is to destroy Othello by attacking him through his one greatest weakness, his love for his wife, Desdemona. Iago initiates a, a calumny. He initiates a false story about Desdemona being unfaithful. And he, he directs that at Desdemona's father, the man most inclined to jump to act on this and it will surely get back to Othello. So here we see that plan taking place. Call up her father, rouse him, make after him, poison his delight, proclaim him in the streets and sense her kinsmen. And though he is in a few fertile climate dwell, plague him with flies, though that his joy be joy yet throw such chances of vexation on it as it may lose some color. Awake, what ho, Brabantio? Thieves, thieves! Your daughter, if you have not given her leave, I say again, hath made a gross revolt, tying her duty, beauty, wit, and fortunes in an extravagant and wheeling stranger of here and everywhere. Straight satisfy yourself. If she be in her chamber or your house, let loose on me the justice of the state for thus deluding you. Though I do hate him, as I do hell pains, yet for necessity of present life, I must show out a flag and sign of love, which is indeed but sign. That you shall surely find him. Lead to the Sagittary the raised, the raised search, and there will I be with him. So farewell. And there we have the story of Iago. Iago brings about um, tremendous um, pain and damage to those around him. He caused the death of Othello, Desdemona, and the character Amelia, among others, through nothing but envy and grievance and hatred. So now we move on to Don John. In Much Ado About Nothing, Don John is the brother of the beloved Don Pedro. He has a nature that is at the odds with nature. He's a, he's a very malcontent, misanthropic young man. He has a sense of grievance, but it's self-inflicted. You know, he has put the world at a distance and so he, he resents the fact that the world puts him at a distance. All he cares about is to sow chaos, ruin everybody's happiness. And he does have an, a desire for revenge against one of Don Pedro's officers who was partly responsible for him being essentially under house arrest. Uh, he created chaos affecting many of the characters in the play and ulti ultimately, he's thwarted inadvertently by an inept local constable, which is quite humorous. So let's have a look at, uh, at Don John. And I am my own tech support. Sorry, this one first. What the good year, my lord? Why are you thus out of measure sad? There is no measure in the occasion that brings. Therefore, the sadness is recovered. You should hear reason. And when I have heard it, what blessing brings it? If not a present remedy, at least a patient supplement. However, that thou, being as thou sayest thou art, born under Saturn, 
and what's about to apply a blow of medicine to a mortifying mystery? I cannot hide it. I must be sad when I have cause and smile at no man's jest. Eat when I have stomach and wait for no man's leisure. Sleep when I am drowsy and tend on no man's Laugh when I am merry, and claw no man in his humor. Yea, but you must not make the full show of this till you may do it without control. You have of late stood out against your mother, and he hath taken you meanly into his grace, where it is impossible you should take true root, but by the fair weather that you make yourself. It is needful that you frame the season for your own harvest. I had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. And it better fits my blood to be the stain of all than to fashion a carriage to rob love from any. In this, though it cannot be said I am a flattering honest man, it must not be denied I am but a plain dealing with I am trusted with a muzzle and a franchise with claw. Therefore, I have decreed not to sing in my cage. If I had my life, I would bite. If I had my liberty, I would do my liking. In the meantime, let me be that I am, and seek not to alter me. Can you make no use of your discontent? I made all use of it, for I use it only. Who comes here? What news, Braccio? I came yonder from the great supper. The prince, your brother, is royally entertained by Leonardo, and I can give you intelligence of an intended marriage. What's so for any model to go, Mr. Bond? What is he for a fool who betrothes himself to him? Mary, it is your brother's right hand. Who? The most exquisite Claudio? Even he. A proper squad. And who? And who? Which way is he? Mary, on hero, the daughter and heir of the A very poor March chick. Okay. Being entertained were perfume, as I was smoking a musty room, comes me the prince and Claudio, hand in hand in sad countenance. I whipped me behind the arras, and there heard it agreed upon that the prince should woo hero for himself, and having obtained her, Give her to Count Claudio. Come, come. Let us enter. This may prove food to my displeasure. That young startup hath all the glory of my lord. If I can cross him anyway, I bless myself every day. You are both sure and will assist me? To the death, my lord. Let us to the great son. Their cheer is the greater that I am subdued. Would that the cook were on my mind. Shall we go through what's to be done? We wait upon you. Don Pedro has learned of a, an impending wedding, and he decides to spoil it by creating yet again another another false story about infidelity. Uh, proclaiming that the young woman is unworthy, uh, which news would destroy her father, a very wealthy landowner, uh, and a very good man. Uh, the plot thickens as Don John learns that it is, in fact, going to happen, and he finds out specifically how his henchman, Baraccio, will bring this about. It is so. The Count Claudio will marry the daughter of Leonato. Yea, my lord, but I can cross it. Any bar, any cross, any impediment will be medicinal to me. I am sick in his splendor, and whatsoever comes before his affection ranges evenly with mine. 
How canst thou cross this? Not honestly, my Lord, but so covertly that no dishonesty shall appear in you. Show me briefly how. I think I told your Lordship a year since how much I am in the favor of Margaret, the waiting gentleman to hear. Remember, I can at any unseasonable instant of the night appoint her to look out at her lady's chamber window. What life is in that to be the death of this marriage? The poison of that lies in you to temper. Go you to the prince your brother. Spare not to tell him that he hath wronged his honor in marrying the renowned Claudia, whose estimation being mightily hold up to a contaminated stare, such a one as hero. What proof shall I make proof of enough that? to misuse the prince? to vex Claudio, to undo Hero, and kill Leonardo. No cue for any other issue? Only to despite them, I would never. Go then. Find me a meet hour to draw Don Pedro and Count Claudio alone. Tell them that you know that Hero loves me. Intend a kind of zeal both to the prince and Claudio, as in love of your brother's honor, who has made this match, and his friend's misreputation, who is thus like to be cozened with the semblance of a maid that you have discovered thus. They will scarcely believe this without trial. Offer them instances which shall bear no less likelihood than to see me at her chamber window. Hear me call Margaret Hero. Hear Margaret turn me Claudia, and bring them to see this the very night before the intended wedding. For in the meantime, I will so fashion the matter that Hero shall be absent, and there shall appear such seeming truth of Hero's disloyalty that jealousy shall be called assurance and all the preparations overthrown. Through this, to what I foresee, I will put you in practice. Be, be cunning in the working this, and thy fee is a thousand dollars. Be you constant in the accusation, and my cunning shall not shame you. I will go presently, let it be. Oh, if only he had a mustache, he would twirl it. Uh, a very, a very evil young man. Okay, now we move on to Cassius from Julius Caesar. Cassius was a member of the Senate in Rome, and his motivation was, as I said, political philosophy. A lot of the senators were objecting to Caesar's ambition, but he had ambitions of his own, and he was envious. He thought that he was better than Caesar. Uh, the interesting thing about Cassius is he was a puppeteer. He sought to work from the shadows and not be the apparent spearhead of the, of the evil action. And his desire was to bring about change by sowing chaos. And the revolution in Rome was quite chaotic. Thank you. Okay. Next video. Call tech support. Okay, here we go. It is just, and it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no such mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eye that you may see your shadow. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus, and groaning underneath our age's yoke, have wished that noble Brutus had his eyes. Tis just. Good Brutus, be prepared to hear. And since you know you cannot see yourself so well as by reflection, I, your glass, will discover to yourself 
that of yourself which you yet know not of. And be not jealous on me, gentle Brutus, were I a common laugher, or did use to stale with ordinary oaths my love to every new protester. If you know that I did fawn on men and hug them hard and after scandal them, or if you know that I profess myself in banqueting to all the rout, then hold me dangerous. I know the virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. Well, honor is the subject of my story. I cannot tell what you and other men think of this life, but for my single self, I had as lief not be as lived to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. I was born free as Caesar, so were you. We both have fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold as well as he. For once upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Darest thou, Cassius, leap in with me now into this angry flood and swim to yonder point? Upon the word, accoutred as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow. So indeed he did. The, the torrent roared, and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive at the point proposed, Caesar cried, Help me, Cassius, or I sink! I, as Aeneas, a great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder the old Anchises bear, so from the waves of Tiber did I the tired Caesar. And this man is now become a god, and Cassius is a wretched creature and must bend his body of Caesar carelessly but not on him. He had a fever when he was in Spain. And when the fit was on him, I did mark how he did shake. It is true, this God did shake. His coward lips did from their color fly, and that same eye whose bend off all the world did lose his luster. I did hear him groan. I, that voice of his that bade the Romans Mark him and write his speeches in their books. Alas, it cried, give me some drink to Tinius as a sick girl. Ye gods, it doth amaze me a man of such a feeble temper should so get the start of the majestic world and bear the palm alone. Good Brutus, be prepared to hear. My man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar. What should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be pronounced more than yours? Write them together. Yours is as fair a name. 
sound them, it doth become the mouth as well. Weigh them, it is as heavy. Conjure with them, Brutus will start a spirit as soon as Caesar. Now, in the name of all the gods at once, upon what meat does this our Caesar feed that he has grown so great? Age, thou art shamed. Rome, thou hast lost the breed of noble bloods. When, when there was an age since the great flood, but it was feigned with more than with one man. When could they say till now that talked of Rome, that her wide walls encompassed but one man? Now is it Rome indeed, and room enough when there is in it but one man? Oh, you and I have heard our fathers say there was a Brutus once that would have brooked the eternal devil to keep his state in Rome as easily as a king. So Cassius uh, initiated the assassination of Julius Caesar and brought about a period of revolution. Um, ironically for him, he wanted to be the, the leader of that revolution, but Brutus rose to that level. Uh, so he was not as successful as he had hoped to be. Okay, now we move on to Lady Macbeth of the Scottish play. She was motivated by a lust for power that came out of nowhere. She explicitly declared her evil intent and went even further. She literally pledged her soul to the powers of darkness to make her sufficiently evil to carry out this plan. She cold-bloodedly plotted multiple murders and she was relentless. And when her husband faltered, she went at him like an enemy just the same. Lady Macbeth. They met me in the day of success, and I've learned by the perfectest report that they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned and desired to question them further, they made themselves air, into which they vanished. Whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it came missives from the king, who all hailed me, Thane of Cawdor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with hail king that shall be. This is my thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightest not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. Long as thou art, and Cawdor, it shall be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that thou wouldst holily, would not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou have great longs, that which cries, thus thou must do, if thou have it. Yet that which rather thou have a fear to do, than wishes to be undone. Hide thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valor of my tongue, all that impedes thee from the golden realm, 
which faith and metaphysical aid does seem to have thee crowned with all. Give him tending. He brings great news. Come, you spirits. that tend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of the direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breast and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you wait upon nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and call me in the dunnest smoke of hell that my keen night see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peek through the blanket of the dark to cry, ho, ho. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Your face, my fame, is like a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time. They're welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He that is coming must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall all our days and nights to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. Only look up clear, to alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? And hath it slept since, and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to live the same in thy own act and valor as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteem's ornament of life, and yet live a coward in thine own esteem? But I dare not wait upon thy ruin like the poor cat in the adage. What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now doesn't make you? I have given suck. And know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it were smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out had I so sworn as you have done to this. We fail, but screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall this day's hard journey soundly invite him? His two chamberlains will I with wine and wassail so convince that memory, the water of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason, a limbic only. When in their swinish sleep, their drenched natures lie as in a death, what cannot you and I put upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers? Who shall bear the guilt of our great quill? <laughs> 
So Lady Macbeth initiated a civil war in Scotland and, and many died. But she had no vision beyond Macbeth's ascension to the throne. She in fact committed the murders that her husband lacked the nerve to commit. And now we come to our final villain, the unforgettable Richard III. Richard is, when I talk about villains being fun, Richard is fun. In the film versions of Richard III, Richard turns to the screen, breaks the fourth wall and addresses the audience directly, delighting in his own evil, delighting in the witty ways that he is able to destroy his enemies. In the first scene, we see Richard declaring his evil. In the second scene, he has just met with Lord Clarence, who is on his way to the Tower of London. And he says to Clarence, don't worry, Clarence, I've got your back. I will intercede up with the king upon, for your benefit. No, no, he's the one who whispered in the king's ear in the first place. And so he proclaims that Clarence is soon to die. And then he decides that he must have a royal bride. And in one of the most really challenging scenes I've ever seen in Shakespeare, he woos the, the widow of a man that he killed. Um, he successfully woos her. She just surrenders to him and he gloats on that. So here are three scenes from Richard III. Is that a woman in this human? Nope. Yep. <clears throat> now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this sullen war. And all the clouds that lord upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean bed. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to many meetings. Grim visage war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to front the souls of fearful adversaries, he came as newly in the lady's chamber to the deceivious pleasing of the lute. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tracks, nor made to court an amorous looking lass, I that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by disassembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up, and so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I hold by them. Why, I, in this, Weak piping time of peace. I've no delight to pass the time, unless to see my shadow in the sun and descant on my own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Thoughts have I laid, inductions dangerous, by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams, to set my brother Clarence and the king, one against the other, in deadly hate. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarence closely be mewed up with a prophecy that says that G of Edward's heir, Samara, shall be. But dive thoughts, down to my soul, it clans comes.
cannot live, I hope, and must not die, till George be back with post or some tavern. I'll into urge his hatred more to Clarence, with lies well sealed with weighty arguments, and if I fail not in my deep intent, Clarence hath not another day to live, which done, God take King Edward to his mercy, and leave this word for me to bustle in. But then I'll marry Warwick's youngest daughter. What? Though I killed her husband and her father? The readiest way to make the wench amends is to become her husband and her father. The which will I, not all so much for love, as for another secret close intent by marrying her which I must reach out to. But yet I run before my horse to market. Baron still breathes, Edward still lives and reigns. Once they have gone, must I count my gains. Was ever woman in this humor wooed? Was ever woman in this humor won? I'll have her, but I'll not keep her long. Why, though I killed her husband and his father, to take her in her heart's extremest hate, with curses in her mouth, tears in her eyes, the bleeding witness of my hatred by God, her conscious of these bars against me, while I have no friends to back my suit at all, Plain devil, the misshapen looks. And yet to win her. Ha! All the world to nothing. Hath she already forgot that brave prince, Edward, her lord, whom I some three months since stabbed in my angry mood at Tewkesbury? A sweeter and lovelier gentleman, framed in the prodigality of nature. Young, valiant, wise and no doubt, right royal. The spacious world cannot again afford. And will she yet to base her eyes on me, that cropped the golden prime of this sweet prince, and made her widow to a woeful bed? On me, whose all matches not Edward's moiety? On me, who halts and is misshapen thus, my dukedom, to a beggarly denier, Oh, yes. I do mistake myself for all this while. She finds upon my life, although I cannot, myself to be a marvellous and proper man. I'll be at charges for a looking glass and entertain a score or two of tailors to study fashions to adorn my body. Since I am crept in favour of myself, I will maintain it with some little cost. But first, I'll turn yon fellow in his grave and return lamenting to my love. Shine out, fair son, till I have bought a glass, that I may see my shadow as I pass. Boo! Hiss! Uh, that was the, uh, that was a very talented Colin Salvatore. Uh, I'll, I'll identify all of our actors uh, before we finish. So I realize the time is short. So let me just quickly share with you that as in any good story, the villain suffers for his evil. So where did they all end up? Well, Iago was arrested. He was wounded, but he lives. Don John fleed justice, but he was caught. He'll be punished. Cassius ordered his own bondsmen to kill him because he swore he would never be taken alive. Lady Macbeth went quite mad and committed suicide. Richard killed in combat, very much alone and unloved and lacking a horse, my kingdom for a horse. So ladies and gentlemen, that is uh, the story of Shakespeare's villains. Um, I appreciate the uh, being invited to uh, to present this. Uh, thank, I want to thank uh, Nancy Terrell and Laura Daniel of the Arts Council uh, for inviting me to do this. And I'd like to acknowledge my actors. As Iago, uh, we had David Pierce. As John John, we had Michael Ludwig. 
with Stuart Moore and myself doing voiceovers. For Cassius, we had Michael Beecher. For Lady Macbeth, we had Blanche Baxter. And for Richard III, we had Colin Salvatore. Thank you. If you have any questions, I would be happy to address them. So um, I don't see any questions yet in the chat box, but we, if you have some, uh, please put them there. My first question is, in, do you have a favorite villain? Villain? Did you save the best for last? I certainly did. Uh, I have seen many presentations of Richard III, and uh, there's no way to do him wrong. Uh, you know, Colin performed without makeup and without, you know, hunchback and all of that, but it doesn't matter. The, 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 the gift of, of Richard was his tremendous intellect, his tremendous wit. He was a genius in battle. Um, he was a very effective warrior, um, very much like Tyrion on Game of Thrones. He was underestimated by those closest to him, and for the most part, he showed them. Unfortunately, he reneged on every promise he made to everyone who helped him get to the top, so when he was then besieged, he was all alone. Um, it's gratifying to watch time and time again. So for sure, he's my favorite. Oh, terrific. And I don't see any questions coming up in the chat box. Tracy, do you have any questions? I don't have any questions, but that was a very interesting um, commentary. It was, and the acting was wonderful. So thank you for sharing it. Thank you. I'm very lucky to have uh, such fabulously talented actors available to us. And in case people didn't notice, all of that was shot so low in front of a green screen. And then we superimposed them on various backgrounds. And uh, we're getting better at that as we do the virtual theater projects. So, uh, so I thought I'd have a little bit of fun with that. But the most fun was watching the actors actually record their scenes because they were just marvelous marvelous well terrific and i appreciate the time that you took and your actors took to make this an interesting cultural conversation for us tonight i want to thank pnc for your financial support of the arts council and our efforts to make martin county a more vibrant arts community a couple of um, coming attractions if you will next week the, on the 11th, we are doing a virtual meet and greet with the photographer Clyde Butcher, who is currently featured in the Courthouse Cultural Center galleries. That will be facilitated by our friend, uh, Eve Samples, who's the executive director of the Friends of the Everglades. And of course, we'll be hearing a lot about Clyde's work in the Everglades. Then we have on the 20th and 21st, Arts Fest is coming to downtown Stewart all kinds of fun activities that weekend, about 50 plus artists, food trucks, green market, entertainment all day, both days, including a presentation by ACT Studio Theater of A Midsummer's Night's Dream. So we'll continue with our Shakespeare theme and uh, then Cultural Conversations returns in on the second Tuesday, first Tuesday of March uh, with the Art and Science of Photography. So we hope you tune back in then and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.